I think everything, everything happens in a time. You know, um, there's a time for everything. There's a time to be in a group, and there's a time to be solo. At least there was for me. Um, if I had had it my way, I would have been in a group forever. You know, I enjoyed the group atmosphere. I thought, you know, it's so good to have two guys on stage backing you up. But um, the interesting thing about entertainment is that when you're struggling, everybody goes in with the same goals. You know, but somewhere along the success area, you start to look at everyone around you and go, wait a minute, where are you going? Where are you headed? Because I'm going this way. Wait, what happened? I thought we were all on the, you know, and um, sometimes success can do that. Sometimes it, it really uh, illuminates, you know, creative differences, spiritual differences, you know, um, emotional differences. And I, you know, just like a, a, a young person would think that, you know, the friends that you, my fifth grade friends are going to be my friends forever, you know, throughout high school, throughout. And it's not that they cease being your friends, but sometimes you just mature to a place and some people get there faster, some people don't, you know. And, and you know, hope, hopefully, ultimately, everyone catches up. But, um, you know, I, uh, it, it, it's really interesting because I didn't actually make a decision to be solo. It really just happened. I, I promise you that it's hard to explain, but you know, I had intended to be in the group forever until I found myself in, in circumstances where I felt the, the inner desire to express myself freely and openly without any constraint, you know, without anybody saying, hey, that's, you can't say that. That's not, that's not fly, you can't say that. People won't, you know what I mean? So, you know, the only way I could have done that was in doing a solo release. Well, the good part about it is I think that God, you know, surrounded me with the right team, you know, with the team that I needed to help me exercise all of my ideas, you know. It's like, you know, I, you, you, need, you need that. You need that army. You need that force, you know what I mean? No, no man is an island, you know. So I refuse to, to take all the praise, you know, for that because they were talented musicians, you know. They were talented engineers. They were talented production assistants who really, really, you know, were there, who really were there. And if I had an idea, I was able to express it and, you know, made them stay and work diligently till it was expressed. And, you know, that, that I appreciate. I appreciate the fact that if there's a will, there's a way. You know, miseducation, um, you know, it, um, wow. It, it, every day it means something more <laughs> to me, actually. Um, people automatically thought, you know, oh my, she must not have done, you know, maybe my, their teachers didn't teach anything, but that, that wasn't it. Um, the, the meaning behind it was really sort of a, of a catch in, in me learning that, you know, when I thought I was my most wise, really not wise at all. And then my humility, you know, and, and in those places that most people wouldn't expect a lesson to come from, that's where I learned so much. And, uh, you know, and so I termed the phrase miseducation, you know, not because it was a miseducation per se, but just because it was sort of contrary to what the world says is, is education, you know, it was this education that came from life and experience you know, and um, not necessarily academic, all academic, but related to living. I've gone through a lot, you know, a, a huge emotional and, and, and spiritual battle prior to the creation of that album. And the, the funny thing is that while I was going in the battle, I couldn't see my hand despite my face. I mean, I really couldn't see anything because I was so emotionally entangled in everything that I'd gone through. But it was like once I was delivered from that situation, you know, and once I got the perspective, was able to look back at heartache and look back at pain and disappointment, for some reason, it all was so clear, you know. It, it was just like a, you know, the picture started to form itself. The songs started to create themselves. I was able to look back and, 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 uh, and, and be a narrator of my own situation. But the interesting thing was that it, didn't, it couldn't happen while I was in the middle of the, 
of the confusion. You know, it was about a young woman, you know, in the music industry, uh, you know, and the pitfalls, the snares, the traps, and they don't stop. They keep coming. You know, they don't stop. I think that because I, I grew up in such a loving family structure, I thought that everybody did, and therefore I thought that everybody reaped the, the benefit of that love. And pretty naive way to think. And so I learned very important lessons about people and their voids and how when you have voids, you know, like a, like a black hole just sucks, you know, and consumes everything into it, you know. And I, I met a lot of those people. You know, here I was, this ship, mm, I just want to love, <laughs> you know, and I met a lot of black holes, a lot of people with a lot of deep, deep, painful voids and, you know, who found it easy to take advantage and to manipulate and to dece deceive someone with me who just, mm, you know, all I want to do is love. I, I had to learn from those things painfully, you know, but even now I, I, I thank God for correction. You know, I even thank him for hardship because it shows me exactly where I am, where I was, and where I need to be. So it was important. It was a very important record. Interestingly enough, you know, um, that record was all about what I feel, you know. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the next record becomes because that will probably be about what I think, you know, as opposed to what I feel, everything that I feel, you know. It'll be what I feel still, you know, but it's also going to be something conscious. You know, a lot of that was unconscious creation, un unconscious creativity because I was so overwhelmingly emotional. You know, it was just like I, I couldn't, I just had to write about this. Every time that God navigates my ship, there's, there's nothing cerebral going on. There's very little, you know, there's very little thought. It's almost as if I have the directions. Every time I try to do it myself, I'm, you know, I'm conjuring up my own concoction and trying. And, I, and, I, and it, you know, it, it, it's a little more difficult to do it that way because it takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of energy. But it's like when I'm led, you know, it, it, it kind of really is just it's all there and it's clear. These, these, these are your orders. Just go forth and carry them out. And um, so I was going to say, you know, that this album gets to be what I think, but I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what that will be? Because I think that what I've consciously decided to do is be patient and wait for those instructions again, as opposed to the instructions from the record company. You know, I, I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't fulfill their needs, you know, I, I can't, um, um, beca because it, it, it's devoid of, of all feeling, you know what I mean? I have to make sure that, that what I create, you know, I, I never want to condescend. There are a lot of people who condescend to the audience, you know, they, they just think, oh, they like anything, just throw a beat on it and put your voice on it. But if it doesn't move me, then I don't think it's worthy enough to put out there and move someone else, you know what I mean? Like it, 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 it has to be something that is, is, is personally, you know, is, is, is something that I need personally. That's my barometer for whether or not it's good for the people. Not just anything, just, you know, just make a beat, it's hot, throw it out there. You know, that, that I can't use that barometer, that, that doesn't work with me. I personally don't feel the pressure. The pressure is out there. <laughs> yeah, but I don't, I don't feel it. I, I really, really don't. Um, you know, it does exist. Everyone, you know, I see people, hey, where's that record company? You coming, you know, you can't leave us hanging like that. We need something else. Or the record company, you know, the, the, the window of opportunity is almost closed. But I just don't think that those rules apply to me. And not because of me, but I just think that it's something spiritual and something bigger. And I think that um, if you respond to the needs of the people, you know, that, that, that's timeless. There is not a window of opportunity for people's needs. My whole life at, at, the, at a certain point was studio and, and uh, you know, uh, studio, hotel, stage, hotel, stage, studio, stage, hotel, studio, stage, you know, and, you know, and I was expressing, I, I was expressing everything from my past, everything that I, had, you know, I had 
experienced prior to that studio stage time. And it was like, you know, you, you, you have to go back to the well, you know, in order to, you know, in order, in order to, to, to give someone something to drink, you know, you can't, I felt like a cistern, you know, dried up and like there was nothing more, you know, and I, and it, it was so beautiful because um, normalcy, I returned to a normal situation with my children running around, screaming, <laughs> you know, and, and it was wonderful. And I walked down the street and I went grocery shopping and I loved it. Every minute of it I love. I find, you know, even when it's raining, I just go outside, I look outside and I, I'm just so blessed to see it and to experience it because for such a long time I was just indoors. The whole concept of success to me is, is a little bit warped. Because what are you being successful at in your house trap? That, that's not successfully living. You know, I, I don't buy into that whole concept of success, that I have this mountain with this moat around it, and then I get into my, you know, my big car and, you know, and drive to my destination and never see people. That, that's, see, that's not my concept of success. You know, my concept of successful living is escaping the matrix, as we talked about, you know. It, um, you know, has very little to do with what people think success is. I actually feel successful right now, even though, you know, I don't have an album out or a video or a song on the radio because I'm trying to be obedient to his will. I'm trying to be, you know, a loving and caring mother a loving and caring wife to be, a loving and caring daughter, a loving and caring friend, a responsible person. And every day is another opportunity for me to be successful at that. The other stuff, I think it'll come. I think, you know, that I, I don't think I know, you know, there are certain gifts that each of us have. You know, the gifts we don't have to worry about so much because God gave them to us. It's, it's, it's the living, it's the life, it's the now, you know, it's wisdom without understanding is what is it? You know, how do you, you're so wise, you're so intelligent, but how do you apply that to your life? Is your life in turmoil? I was born in East Orange. I lived in Newark for a brief time. Um, moved to New York for a short period of time and then moved to South Orange. And uh, South Orange was, <clears throat> it was interesting because it was this um, very diverse, and I, I can't just say South Orange, I have to say the area surrounding South Orange because Newark is the city and then the oranges are the suburbs, okay? And um, you know, I lived in, <clears throat> in this suburb where it was like, I, I'd say 50%, maybe 40% uh, 40% black, 60% Jewish. And uh, I grew up with this, this very eclectic, uh, just interesting exposure to all these different cultures. And of course, Manhattan is right there. So, you know, just from the time I was very young, exposed to the Jewish community, the Asian community, the, the West Indian community, the Cuban community, the Latin community, you know, just, just a myriad of cultures in this one area. My mother was a teacher, <laughs> she was an educator and, you know, but I, even, even if she wasn't, I really think that I, I, I had a love, um, I, I don't know if it was necessarily for academics more than it just was for achieving, period, you know, and if it was academics, if it was sports, if it was music, if it was dance, whatever it was, I, I, you know, I was always driven to do a lot in whatever field or, you know, whatever area I was focusing on at the moment. So I, I did well in school. Um, but um, learned a lot from that too, you know, learned a lot from the school, the school atmosphere, the school setting, but so much of my experiences came around school, you know, not so much in the classroom, but what took place outside the classroom. A lot, a lot of those life lessons were attained outside, inside as well, but outside also. My parents had a love for music. They had a love for um, 
there was, there was so many records, you know, so much music constantly being played. My mother played piano, my father uh, sang, and, and it was just music, always surrounded in music. I remember one of, one of my earliest memories was in a house in East Orange that we lived in where, it's, you know, either Sundays or Saturdays, maybe Saturdays, we would clean the house and my mother would play, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder's uh, Songs in the Key of Life, the whole album. I just remember hearing Isn't She Lovely and, you know, and pretending to iron, you know. So from a very young age, there was a lot of music. When I was nine years old or something around that age, I found a, a 45 record in the basement that belonged to my mother. And, uh, you know, I had one of those little, those little record players that you carry in a little suitcase. So that was the only record that would fit on, <laughs> you know, in my personal record player. So I played it. And whatever the song was, it, it touched me, you know, it moved me, and I realized that I wanted to find more of those little records. That's what I used to call them. Where are the little records? I, I want to find these little records. And, uh, you know, went into the basement and just, like, unearthed tons and tons of these records from my mother's, you know, childhood and her youth. And so here I am, eight, nine years old. Everybody else is listening to New Edition and whatever current, you know, uh, group is on the radio, and I'm listening to, like, Shep and the Limelights and Gladys Knight and the Pips and, you know, and all of these older groups and really loving it and becoming, you know, just in, just doused myself, doused myself in all this music and all this this, this musical history. And, and they really were my teachers, my musical teachers. I didn't have, you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't go to Juilliard or I wasn't classically trained, but... By listening, you know what I mean, I, I grew an appreciation for uh, certain musical philosophies and ideas and concepts. You know, I, I understood what drums and bass and, you know, and all different types of instrumentation were just by virtue of my exposure to this music. I would fall asleep to it. We always talk about how, you know, students who don't want to study, put your book under the pillow and sleep, but I literally fell asleep with the music and I think there's so much of that, you know, I soaked up even in my dreams. What's going on, Marvin Gaye? I just remember like playing the first side over and over again. You know, there was one of those old record players. After I moved up from the uh, the little suitcase record player, there was a a bigger record player that my grandmother had given to me, and it was one of those old arms. That, you know, when you pressed repeat, it turned and went down. And I I used to play my records aloud until one night my mother was like, "This is too loud. I'm not having it." And so I put on headphones. But in order for me to listen to the records. You know, the headphones didn't stretch all the way to my bed from the record player. So I had to sleep on the floor in order to hear the records. And that's where I slept until, high, until college. I slept on the floor right next to the record player until I was probably 19 years old, really. I mean, I just started sleeping in the bed again <laughs> because my records, you know, that was, that was their space, the bed. And I just stayed on the floor listening to this music from, you know, morning to night. Actually, to be very honest with you, I don't listen to a lot of music at all anymore, anymore at all. I, I think that's very bizarre, too, because it was such a comfort zone for me. But I don't know if I had my fill, you know, but I don't listen to a lot of music anymore because I'm, I'm, I'm creating it now. You know, the, everything takes place in a season. There was a season where that's all I did was listen. And now I'm just in a place where I, I don't listen, I create. And if I do listen... You know, there are specific things that I listen to and for specific reasons. I'm no longer listening for the, you know, I, I rarely, I, I don't want to say I no longer, but I rarely listen for the sheer pleasure. I'm listening for the tool. I'm listening for the instrument. I'm listening for the art. I'm listening for, boy, that was, that was crazy what they just did. Boy, that changed, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, it's, it's very weird. I think that part of that is, is why I'm making music now is to make it for other people to listen to for pleasure and hopefully... Later on, maybe they'll listen to me and they go, well, that bass line, boy, did you hear the way those drums interacted with that or that change? You know what I mean? So, you know, I think we all have <clears throat> a certain corner to hold. We, uh, later, earlier this year, um, Curtis Mayfield uh, passed away and we, there was a memorial and they asked me to sing at the memorial. And I was realizing that um, what Curtis represented in the 60s and 70s, you know, it's like there's a season and, and it's, it's not really about the, the messenger per se, it's more about the message and how he had a time where he had to hold it because there, you know, other people were singing love songs and other things, you know, he had a very uh, political 
you know, spiritual message. And even though it was entertaining and you enjoyed it and you could dance to it, you know, there was, there was this, this, this very heavy value. And, I, and as I listened to his eulogy and as I listened to the music, I mean, music that I grew up listening to, it just dawned on me that, that our generation is no different. You know, someone has to hold it. You know, when everyone else is being indulgent and doing whatever they want to do, you know, someone has to be responsible so that that music reaches and, and touches, you know, a specific chord. And that may not be me. <laughs> you know, I may lose my mind tomorrow, and <laughs> but it's got to be somebody. <laughs>
a heavy, you know, very serious interest in my creativity from the time I was very young, and not for the sake of, you know, they, they didn't know what would come of it, just because I enjoyed it, you know, and to me, that's a reflection of, of love, when someone can see you enjoying yourself and want to participate or want to encourage or want to help you to do something that you enjoy. You know, it wasn't about making her a star. It was just, hey, she likes to do this, let's support it. Actually, the music became, came before the acting, but while I was doing music, I found myself meeting people who acted, you know, and, and they exposed me to that field. And I was kind of like, hey, all right, I'll try it. You know, always thinking, well, music is my first love. And, and I just stumbled. I mean, when I tell you I stumbled upon all this, actually, I didn't stumble because there are no accidents. But I did not, you know, I, I didn't have that uh, intense ambition to be a musician or an actress. You know, I just enjoyed it, you know, and if there was an opportunity, hey, you know, I'll go. And by enjoying it, because I loved it, it, it enabled me to, to get better at what I was doing, you know what I mean? Because there was a love behind it. It wasn't like, I've got to do this, you know, there wasn't just, you know, naked ambition. It, yeah, I really enjoyed what I was doing. And all the while that I enjoyed it, I was happy doing it, I was content doing it, whether it was for three squirrels in the park or, you know, for three acorns as compensation. I mean, it didn't, it didn't matter to me. And because we loved it so much, I think that that uh, was a reflection, you know, to others. I think that they, they saw that, you know, that to me, you know, penetrated the minds and the hearts of people more than, hey, look how well we can play, you know, it was kind of, there, there was something else that was communicated you know, by the music and, and, and by the artistry. And that created opportunity. Definitely, but I don't think that's sophisticated. <laughs> you know, I think that is just some straight, you know, ghetto singing into the hairbrush <laughs> in the mirror. You know, I, I, there was nothing sophisticated about it at all. It was really, you know, it was where I grew up. Everyone was like that, you know what I mean? Everyone. You know, it's like, uh, you know, especially in my family, you know, there, there, was, there was not an abundance of wealth, but there was an abundance of love. So there was always humor, you know, and there was joy and there was comfort and there was this environment just to have a good time. And in having a good time, sometimes, oh, you stumble upon a talent. Well, I like to sing. I'm going to sing this song. Hey, you can sing. Did you know that, girl? I can. <laughs> you know, and let me take this a little more seriously. But, you know, it was just something that we all did. You know, it really was um, the performance part of, of humanity. You know, I think I was just acting out on, on, on my humanity, you know, on, on this gift that, that God gave me and just being a kid, you know, really being a kid. And if I became sophisticated while I was doing that, if that took place, then, you know, I didn't know about it because I certainly wasn't trying to. You know, I just tried to sing that song just like Whitney Houston, you know what I mean? That's, that's really was the, the goal at that point. But, um, you know, if you love something, man, you know, if you love something and if you're committed and, and, and diligent, you know, the things that happen, I mean, you know, there's some people who are, are blessed with gifts, but then there are certain people who can work toward, you know, even with the gift that I have now, I mean, I'm not, I've leaned on God for so long. Hey, God, you just gave me this gift and I'm just going to go out there and sing. But it's, it's only now that I'm realizing how much larger and how expansive my gift becomes when I actually pay attention to it and try to, try to you know, practice and try to perfect it. I've always, you know, I'm, I'm not going to warm up. I'm just going to go in the studio and sing this song and inspiration will take me. And yes, that's true. You know, we, we are inspired to do things and, 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 and definitely. But, you know, now I'm understanding that like in the Bible, for example, when it talked about David, you know, it's always said that David was a skillful player. He played cunningly, you know, so that, that took practice. And I'm, you know, I'm not afraid of that anymore. I'm, I'm, that, that's exciting to me. Boy, that's an interesting question. I, you know, my mother's right there, but I, I didn't know what my father did for the first 15 years of my life. Every, everybody who asked me, I would say I just works with computers or something. I don't know, because he was a consultant. <laughs> he was like, and consulting is such a vague term, you know, when you consult. But uh, my father was a, he was a computer consultant. And, uh, you know, only now that I do some consulting sometimes, so I understand exactly what consulting means. But uh, 
my father was, he, he was brilliant, I tell you, because he, uh, he was just exposed to so much culture and he exposed us to so much culture. I remember being like, you know, seven years old, wanting to go to International House of Pancakes on Saturday and my father takes us to dim sum you know, which is, which is like a Chinese brunch and like, or Chinese breakfast, and me being like, what is, you know, but really learning and enjoying and appreciating culture and, and not just my, that, that wasn't just my own from a very young age. They, like everyone else, have just been carried away, no, I'm only kidding. They, yeah. They've lost it completely. They, no, my parents are very humble, very real, you know, my mother's, always very honest with me and um, I'm you know I'm thankful for that because I need that you know you need someone who just you know can 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 penetrate the facade and say I knew you win and let's go back there right now <laughs> so definitely they've, they've definitely handled it well Probably was about 13. You, I, I guess professionally would be, I guess, the first time I entered into a studio or, you know, uh, film and, and maybe television, yeah. perform for money. Yeah. He was probably about 13, 14 years old, something like that. Um, you know, once again, you know, all these opportunities were just presented. You know, I did not go out and pursue them. And, um, you know, I was always surprised. I was always very surprised you know, at, at, at how people received what, what I did. I was always like, really? I said those lines okay? <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, um, but I think I, I just had a, 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 there was a certain amount of seriousness from a, from a child. I, I understood that, I think that my work ethic, I think the work ethic that was established in my family was also something very important. You know, um, the, you know, if you plant the seed, if you, you know, if you, you know, sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow in abundance, you'll reap in abundance. So that was, you know, always sort of in us from very young. So even the things that I loved, I tried to, you know, put a couple seeds in the, you know, a bunch of seeds in the ground and see what sprung up. And sometimes it was acting and sometimes it was music. But whatever it was, I continued to plant. She gave me a piece of bread, which was, you know, love and encouragement. You know, the correction was the meat, the substance. And then she would sandwich that, you know, sandwich that with, the, with another piece of bread, which was, you know, love and encouragement. So, you know, that was very important in, in, in shaping and molding our, our morality, you know, our understanding of ourselves, you know, making sure that, that we didn't think we were better than or less than anyone you know, feeling no more worthy or no less worthy, you know, than anyone else. And all that was, was really, really crucial and, and prepared me for where I am now. You know, that, that, that is very important preparation. Well, the first Grammy I won was with the Fugees. Um, <clears throat> Oh boy, I'm, I'm not good at these answers because, you know, I don't know the response for that one. I guess I, I was honored, you know what I mean? But the honor to me um, has less to do with the award. You, you know what I'm saying? It, it, uh, to me, that translates in the relationship that I have with the audience and if my music, uh, is helpful to them, you know, that's the award, you know, and, and that, you know, that, you know, if I, if I never won a Grammy, you know, um, I would be satisfied if in fact I could help people because it, it's, it's really, really not about that. Um, and I don't say that because it sounds like something cool to say. I mean, really, you know, if those Norris people knew how we treat no one kidding. <laughs> My mother has that stuff, all the awards and stuff, because, you know, if I walked downstairs every day and I saw all my achievements, it would be so easy to become complacent. Oh, I've got all of these, and look at those. I don't need to do anything else. 
but life is, is, is continued work. It's, it's constant learning. I don't even, the whole concept of retirement, I don't even buy into. You know, we should constantly be working, maybe not physically working, but we could be spiritually, emotionally working toward bettering ourselves and bettering the lives of others around us. So I'm, you know, I, I, I get really afraid of those little comfort, you know, those, those things that make us feel like, you know, we did something great. Because I've done nothing. I've done nothing. And I mean that sincerely. There's a time for rest, you know, but, um, you know, I just, I don't believe in, in, in getting comfortable just because everyone says you've arrived. You know, that's not what it's all about. Once you, you, you compromise yourself in one way, you compromise yourself in another way. And you've just opened the door to, <laughs> you know, compromise, mediocrity, settling. And I don't mean, when I say mediocrity, I don't mean, uh, um, I mean that we should constantly be aspiring, you know, to reach higher and higher and higher. We should never be comfortable where we are. You know, we should always be aspiring to, to know more and to better ourselves and to improve ourselves, you know, to improve ourselves. Because that's how we improve the world around us, by working within us. You improve yourself, light up the corner that you live on. You know, you may not touch a gazillion lives, but you can light up your own space, light up your home, As long as I remember that the glory is his and not my own. When I confuse that, I get in trouble. But when I remember the proper hierarchy, because see, see, we have it all wrong. We think that we glorify ourselves and that we, you know, the object is to glorify God first. And in doing that, you become glorified. You get glorified. You know, there are certain times when, of late especially, that God has shown me, you know, just be quiet, because I started to feel like I always had to expound, you know, and say something profound. And just stop thinking. And if I could tell you that I was totally unprepared, I don't, I, I, I can't prepare anything because I always just, I just drop it because it's just too cerebral. And when I'm feeling in here, I just all this ball of energy inside, and when you know, it just doesn't work, you know with my intellectual mind, they just, the two are like, <laughs> you know, so I either, one has to take control, either I suppress that spirit, you know, or I suppress my brain, and it usually works out the best when I, you know, suppress, and not, not kill, not destroy, but just suppress, allow my spirit, you know, to navigate the rest of my, you know, devices, instead of allowing those things to have control over my spirit, because, you know, I just, uh, I have a considerable amount of confidence, but it's not in me. You know, it's, it's, it's the work that God's doing in me that makes me confident. I don't have a, an American dream. I have a dream because my dream relates to the entire world. You know, and to be honest with you, I mean, that is that the entire world, you know, find, have salvation that the entire world have joy, that the entire world know God and have peace and have his rest and his happiness. You know, for me to limit that and say that that's an American dream, that would be far too limiting. That's a, a dream for this entire world, that we really all have the presence of God in our lives because I can't give anyone anything more, you know, I. God showed me I can sing songs about love, I can sing songs about me, and those people enjoy those songs. But when they're desperately, desperately in need of help, what will my music do? How will it help them? Will it redeem them? Will it save them? Will it fight that battle for them? You know, it's just a song. <laughs>